Hello, Bill. Hello, Matt. Welcome to the DMZ, our, I think, our first autumn episode. <laughs> well, we called the last one autumn, but that was more because it felt like autumn, not that it actually was autumn. Well, next time I'll be drinking hot cider to prove, <laughs> in front of a fireplace, to prove that it is, in fact, autumn. But... Uh, do, you, do, you have, do you have proper cider in Washington, D.C.? I, I think you have to be in New England for that. We have to bring it in from from Massachusetts, typically. <laughs> but, uh, uh, we we can know. talk about this later, but, you know, uh, there is a hot Senate race here, and yeah. it is the best time of year to be in New England. So if you want to do some on-the-ground reporting uh, of the Brown-Warren race, you know, there's no better place to do it than the Pioneer Valley in western Massachusetts. Well, it is a great race. Let's talk about it a little bit. Um, my sense is that uh, it's a little bit like Maryland, my home state. I mean, I know there's more independence in Massachusetts, but in Maryland, we had Governor Bob McDonald, who was an incredibly popular governor, uh, especially for a Republican, high approval ratings. And he was defeated for re-election because Maryland's a Democratic state. This happened uh, in the mid 2000s. So that's maybe what I think that's really the problem that Scott Brown has. He's a great candidate, uh, good looking guy. His voting record has been pretty in keeping with Massachusetts. Can he overcome the fact that Massachusetts is more, much more of a democratic state than a Republican state? Right. That, I think that's definitely the main obstacle. And I think what you found after the convention speech, uh, was simply that, Democrats in Massachusetts and Democratic leaning independents in Massachusetts said, "Oh, she's a Democratic nominee. Okay, <laughs> and, her, and, and her numbers consolidated." Um, the, the thing that and, I don't think has gotten enough attention is that uh, Scott Brown shares the same advisors as Mitt Romney, and so when Scott Brown distances himself from Mitt Romney on things, to me, I think that's like kind of a big deal because they share the same advisors, but no one they sort of give him a pass on that, which I think is interesting. Well, I think Romney has so many other problems that he's dealing with right now that that's the last of, of his concerns. And, and Brown having distance is certainly not, I mean, you know, Brown mentions Obama more than in the last debate that he mentioned Romney. You know, he, he's trying to pretend that he's very close to Obama. Um, so, but what strikes me as most interesting about the race right now, we haven't seen any polling since the debate and since Brown was able to reignite the whole Native American discussion. Uh, and... Now, and that is arguably backfiring to some degree, now that this video surfaced, that Blue Mass Group, the big state Democratic blog here, uh, posted showing Brown A's doing the tomahawk chop and doing these war whoops. Uh, and then, and then uh, the second video that's come out now where someone was war whooping at a, at a, at a event of Scott Brown that Scott Brown was speaking at, and he didn't acknowledge yeah. it, didn't, didn't respond See, I, to it. I don't get the outrage. It would be offensive if she were a Native American. Because she's not a Native American, I think it's funny. I, I don't think it's well, offensive well, at all. Like, again, you know, she, she still is saying that she is part Native American, not predominantly, you know, not 90 Certainly not predominantly. One thirty second, <laughs> But, uh, uh, you, know, you know, Brown started the first debate by literally saying she claims she's a Native American, and as you can see, she is not, which, it, you know, you know, Barack Obama is half white, but if I if I look at him, he doesn't look half white. Uh, and there's plenty of Native Americans in this country that have that have uh, intermarried and, and interrelated, and and therefore no one's going to look Native American necessarily. That's not how we've always judged right, peoples right. of heritage and ethnicities. Uh, this so is true. The, the question is, I mean, that's 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 sort of the academic you know take on it. What I don't know, and I don't claim to have, even though I live here, I'm not from here, I didn't grow up in any of the swing areas of the state. Uh, so what I don't know is, how is the public going to react to this being the dominant topic of the debate, still to slay the race, as opposed to the economy and jobs or, or, or whatever? Uh, and how are they going to take the fact that Brown is being a, very much the aggressor here, which you know, before it was more of a surrogate thing, uh, to him leading the first debate by talking about it, without even being asked about it directly, is that undercut his bipartisan nice guy vibe? And how does this whole war, tomahawk chop deal, does that backfire too? I don't know if it does. Well, if you uh, had to bet, no, if, you, yet. if you had to bet today, and now we're six weeks out, a lot is going to change. Uh, but if you had to bet who will be the next senator from the great state of Massachusetts, 
Who who would you put your money on today? Look, I would still put my money on Warren for what you said. You know, she's, she's the D at the end of her name. So I, I, I think that is going to be dominant. Uh, but I do think it makes her job more difficult, uh, even if there is some backlash to Brown. I do feel like it, every day talking about the Native American issue is a day that Warren's not talking about Scott Brown's voting record, which is her, which is her strongest argument, that he, he's not an independent voice. He's, he's in locks up the Republican Party. He doesn't break ranks when it really matters. Uh, that's what could, that, that helps clarify the D versus R nature of the race, and the Native American issue clouds that. So my gut mm-hmm. is it's still a net negative for Warren that this is being talked about. Uh, I don't know if it's such a negative. I don't really believe that most voters really care one way or the other. It's just not something I think people would be driven by. Uh, by the by the way, Bill, it just occurred to me. I think I don't correct me if I'm wrong. Did I call Bob Ehrlich Bob McDonald? Did I confirm? Oh, you might have. Uh, okay, so Bob McDonald's the governor of Virginia. It was Bob Ehrlich. By the way, the, both guys have the same hair. So you'll forgive <laughs> me for making that mistake. They both have the same hairdo, uh, and they're both kind of moderate Republicans. Although you might disagree, it was Bob Ehrlich, the governor of Maryland, who was very popular um, and lost anyway. Uh, and all the, white male Republicans look the same to me. So they all look alike to me, but I don't see ra- I don't see race, Bill. So um, <laughs> Bob Ehrlich was Maryland. Bob McDonald is Virginia, and your money is on. Elizabeth Warren. My money's still on Warren, but look, my money was on Martha Coakley, so I, my track record is not strong here. Uh, so anyway, um, let's uh, let's move on to to some national stuff. Yeah. Um, it's so much happening. You want to talk? Uh, you want to talk petty pol- petty partisan politics or international <laughs> incident politics? Um, let's start. Let's start with with with, with petty partisan. Let, let, let's, right. let's start small and go big. Later. Um, uh, well, I, let's I start. Would, let's start. I, let's start really small then, uh, because okay. the smallest story I've got is uh, is about Politico's Roger Simon, who yes. <laughs> uh, who this week wrote a piece for Politico um, that alleged that. Uh, that Paul Ryan was going rogue, that he was afraid that the stench of Mitt Romney might stick to him and harm his future political prospects, and that he was going around in private referring to Mitt Romney as the stench. Several media outlets picked up on this, including uh, uh, the New York Times. Is it Krugman? I don't know. One of those, one of those uh, guys at the New York Times. Um, a lot of people picked up on this and believed that the story was in fact true because, you know, Roger Simon always kind of writes funny anyway, and it wasn't, you know, it, it didn't, it wasn't labeled as satire. Uh, it wasn't the Onion. It was Politico, and it turns out it was complete fabrication that Roger Simon thought that everybody would get that this was satire, and and a lot of respected journalists took it to be true. Um, what was your take on that, Bill? Well, it, you know, in, in, as Roger Simon said in a note that he added after the fact, after the there's fact. a line in the, in the column that says, PowerPoint was released by Microsoft in 1990 as a way to euthanize cattle using a method less cruel than hitting them over the head with iron mallets. <laughs> as after Peter successfully argued in court that PowerPoint was actually more cruel than iron mallets, the program was adopted by corporations for slideshow presentations. So I, mean, I, I think Simon at least thought... <laughs> That lines like that made it very, very clear that this was not a reported piece, that this was a satire piece. Now, I grant you, uh, if, considering that Politico is not a satire publication, right. uh, perhaps they should have done some labeling on it to say as such. But like the Times it does this, they had this problem with David Brooks, too. T- David Brooks wrote that column about Romney. Uh, uh, this is before the Thurston Howell column. This was a few years before right. that where it seemed to be this amalgam of media narratives uh, against Romney that, according to Brooks, was intended to be satirical, but it was a little too close to reality, and so no one really looked at it that way. Well, and, and I think I, a couple I, things. I, mean, I think one, the Roger Simon's joke about Microsoft, it's consistent with how he writes. He always writes funny. And so he very well could be writing a serious column about politics and insert a joke about how ridiculous PowerPoint is. Uh, 
is and, and, and how, you know, boring it is. I mean, so that didn't tip off anybody. And again, it fooled a lot of very respected people. Uh, well, and, and, a and lot of, I, I a think lot the of media. Brooks column did the same. I, I think in both cases, you had you know, neither Brooks or Simon, I think, were trying to be duplicitous or trying to misrepresent themselves. You know, they are they're inherently not funny people <laughs> whose job is not to be funny. Well, I think I think Roger Simon so is actually trying to funny. Be funny, which is confusing. Well, I think he norm the problem with Roger Simon is he normally is funny. And so the fact that he would that's where I disagree. <laughs> I think he's a funny guy, but anyway, we disagree on that. But but let me say this the other thing I would say is that we live in a world where nothing surprises us. I mean, if if I found out that uh, Honey Boo Boo was related to Sarah Palin, I would believe it. Because if if a, if a, if a serious news outlet reported that, I'd be like Hell, nothing surprises me anymore. I mean, we are constantly shocked by crazy news that comes out all the time. And so the fact that we should discern that, oh, well, the idea that Paul Ryan would, you know, would be calling Romney the snitch, that's patently absurd. No, crazy stuff like that happens all the time. And by the way, I, I, I actually, when I read, you know, the piece the first time, luckily I didn't write about it, I assumed that, uh, that Roger Simon was trying to tell the truth and that he was using an anonymous source, which very well may be bogus. So I didn't necessarily believe that Paul Ryan was dissing Romney, but I, but I believe that Roger Simon thought he was, or at least was writing a piece. And this could have real implications. I mean, Romney's been trying to put two consecutive days together without a bad gaffe, you know, without a story about his campaign. And now if reporters, you know, ostensibly serious journalists making stuff up, it's crazy. Well, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't think Simon was trying to. Uh, I, I don't think I, I think Simon was honestly trying to write a satire piece. <laughs> I don't think he was trying to, uh, you know, use a flimsy source or trying to dupe people. I, I, I agree. I, I agree that. with you. I agree with you. Uh, but I think that people who are not professional comedians. <laughs> Um, who deal with politics, which in a, in a world where there is a lot of inherent absurdity, part of the fun of covering politics is that so, you know somebody's truth is stranger than fiction. Um, you, know, you can't parody something that's already kind of kind of right. weird. That bill, <laughs> that is a, just a bad journalistic choice. <laughs> and I think a lot of I, I think a lot of columnists who look. I think if you're a professional columnist, it can be very difficult to come with fresh material day after day, week after week. It's tougher, you know. Uh, you know, uh, 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 bloggers like ourselves, uh, as as we deal with the, the difficulties and strains of our very difficult job. Uh, but uh, you have to resist the notion. I'm just gonna I'm gonna let it rip one week and pretend I'm a satirist because that is not what your audience is expecting of you. And if you try that, it's gonna confuse people. It either has to be so obvious that it's obvious, or it has to be labeled as satire. Um, the problem is, Bill, you know, the backdrop of all of this is that we are, the journalism is a profession that is dying in some ways. You, you've got print newspapers going out of business. I think it was Gallup that showed that journalists are less respected and trusted than almost any other profession. And that's why I don't like these um, April Fool's Day jokes that media outlets engage in. Um, because you spend 364 days trying to get people to believe you and, and to trust your credibility. Why would you destroy it intentionally by putting out a bogus story, maybe for a good laugh? Um, so I, I think that that's sort of also a backdrop to this. It's like, you know, am I going to have to... When I, okay, when I pick up Politico and I read a Roger Simon story, I want... I don't... I don't think it's in their interest for me to be questioning whether or not what I read is true. I think it's in their interest for me to assume that Roger Simon is telling me the truth. And now I can't do that. Now I have to question, is he joking? Is this true? And so it's it's sort of like the fourth wall or whatever, right? I mean, um, you know, it, 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 it disintegrates what little credibility and trust there is left between the reader and the writer. I mean, I think if you're reading Roger Simon now, you might, and he's, and he's, and he's sort of joking there, you know, you might ask yourself, 
is this a satire piece or is this an opinion piece or is this a journalism piece? You know, that's the risk you take when you do something, you know, sort of off book or, or, or out of character. Um, but I do think Roger Stein's been around for a long time and, you know, one, you know, one little goof up here I don't think is going to totally destroy his reputation, but that's the risk anyone takes when they do something a little, a little different. Yes. All right. Um, well, so enough about that. <laughs> but I think it was worth now, talking about. Um, I'm I'm curious what you think about the state of the polling of the race now, because for a while, um, even when the poll started to break Obama's way, a lot of conservatives were saying, "Wait, look at Gallup! Look at Gallup! Gallup showing a dead heat." Uh, you know, maybe the, all these other pollsters have bad sampling, bad methodologies. Gallup's a brand name. You know, this race isn't over yet. Yesterday, Gallup jumps up to a six-point lead. Uh, with a sample that is fully after the 47% remarks. Uh, as far as you know, are conservatives still making the case that you can't trust the polling, or did that, did that you know, shake some nerves on your side? Well, I don't know. I, I think a couple things are true. I think Romney is losing today. Um, I think the race will tighten. Um, I think it's going to be a close race. Um, Again, I, I think you have to concede that Romney is losing. I think some of the polls, especially the Washington Post and the New York Times, are sort of uh, mis—they're—they're they're misleading. I, I, they're looking again. I think it's a mistake to look at 2008 as the template to assume that African American turnout will be just as high as it was in a way that young people turnout will be just as high that Hispanic turnout. Now, maybe one or two of those things will, in fact, be the same as 2008. But to assume that they all will, um, I think, is just seems a bit absurd to me. And so um, I, I think that, uh, that Romney is probably losing by a few points, two or three points legitimately. I think the notion that he's losing by, what, a dozen points in Ohio is, is, is ridiculous. And I think it's going to be a very close race. Um, I don't think Republicans should fool themselves into believing that Romney's winning, as some people <laughs> allege. Um, I, I think that uh, you, you have to live in the real world. I do think that there are legitimate concerns about the sampling of some of these polls. And frankly, it's in everybody's best interest to live in the real world. Democrats could become um, overly confident and stay home if they assume their guy's going to win. Well, so and, uh, Clinton suffered a bit of that, I think, in 96, because the polling in that race was so so dominant for Clinton for a long time uh, that the final margin, which was still a decent margin, it was six points, but, uh, right. but it kept Clinton under 50, which wasn't good as far as you know, selling him as having a stronger mandate was concerned, and, and arguably part of that was because folks stayed home. Uh, so, I, I, so I think there's sort of, you know, there's, there's two things here that I, I want to add. Uh, one is that, you know, there's a lot of especially on the Republican side that the the weighting is wrong as far as party ID is concerned, but mm -hmm. different pollsters weigh different things. Some pollsters weigh ID directly and try to project what the partisan uh, demographics of the turnout will be. Some pollsters weigh other demographics right. um, trying to guess what the turnout composition would be, and wherever the party identification falls, they just leave that alone. And, you know, you don't know exactly who's going to be right until you have – uh, the the election and we've had since there hasn't been some there haven't been consistent patterns of, of voter turnout in recent elections it's a, it's it's a, it's art not science um, so uh, I, I it's it's not worth being being critical about those those, those sorts of questions uh, but you there, it, there's such a sweep of polling now that's going in Obama's direction although I think limited polling since the 47 percent comments and but what dribs and drabs we've had after that you have the Gallup poll which is a tracking poll, and I don't really like tracking polls as far as accurate snapshots are concerned, but they're good for moment tracking momentum shifts. You now have a big momentum shift uh, after the 47% remark. Uh, I, I also think the convention, too, Bill. I also think the convention. I mean, I think that well, I mean, um, in, 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 in retrospect, we've seen Bill those Clinton... Polls. We've seen the bounce polls. We've had yeah. a couple weeks post-convention. We've seen Obama get, get a leg up after that, but we haven't seen... But I think, I think there's a possibility that after the 47% video, when you look at those Quinnipiac State polls uh, with the double-digit leads in Florida, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, 
you know, maybe they're outliers, but maybe the tip of the iceberg and the polls we see over the next several days are going to show, you know, a Romney cratering, of, specifically because of that, that, that video. And that makes it hard for him, you know, to the extent that there was, there was an undecided population left, that's all going to move away from him because those videos were so, were so toxic. Uh, I, I, so you're, you're still uh, arguing that this race is certainly going to be close. I think this raises the question: maybe it's not going to be close. I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not, I can't, I'm not going to be with certainty either. Uh, but I, there are certain, there's certainly data points to suggest that perhaps Romney is going to, you know, uh, be stuck with just rum conservative base, and that's it. I think. I mean, who knows? But I think the race is going to tighten. Um, I think that uh, that the turnout, Obama's base will not turn out. At, at the high rates that it did in 08 and at the high rates that some poll, pollsters are assuming. Um, I think that, ro- that there's going to be a lot of money spent between now and the election. I think there's also, there's a theory, and I mean, this, this sounds like happy talk, and maybe it is, but I mean, there's a theory, and a friend of mine described it to me this way. It's like, Obama's like your friend. I mean, you like Obama's very likable, and he's like your buddy, and you wouldn't fire your buddy on a Tuesday. You'd wait till Friday and fire him, and you'd take him out for beers. And you know, there maybe there is this sense among a lot of people that they don't. The economy's not going well. They don't want to fire Obama. They're going to give him every chance, um, and they're going to postpone making that difficult decision. Now, that sounds incredibly optimistic if you're a Republican, um, and I, I don't know that that's a widespread phenomenon. But maybe maybe that is the case among some. Struggling in America. I think it's so, possible. I think there's a flip side, you know, uh, social psychological analysis you could do, which is uh, people that were very frustrated with Obama, they were disappointed. It wasn't as super awesome as they hoped it was going to be. They were kind of grousing about it. But the post convention, seeing the two candidates side by side, you know, being reminded of where we are now versus where we were four years ago, that the better off argument actually did not work in Romney's favor because we remembered how bad that crisis was on top of. Uh, the Libya gaffe and the and the 47 percent uh, video uh, raising further doubts about, about about Romney's cred. That all comes. It's appeal making the late decision to put their disappointments aside and saying, you know, at this point as I am, I still think we're on a decent direction relative to where, where Romney might take me. And that might be hard to undo. You know, I mean, we all talk about six weeks being a lifetime politics, but if some of these if perceptions of a, of an incumbent are pretty set. You know, Robbie seems to be putting a lot of a lot of chips on having a gangbusters debate, but when they've tried to drop, you know, this whole notion of Obama wasn't fully vetted. If we only dig up more video of him from 1998, people will see the real Obama. You know, those things happen. And they're just, and they, and they just completely, you know, fade into the ether because people seem to already know who this guy is and made up their minds about him. So he I, seems to be. I, I mean, look, Romney, if, if Obama seems to be the Teflon president right now. I mean, he's doing a lot of things that I think defy conventional political wisdom. I mean, we've got this chaos in the Middle East. The guy goes to Vegas and does a fundraiser. Uh, he goes on the View. He plays golf all the time. Uh, he he talks about you know the killing of an ambassador and is a, is a bump in the road. It's very out of touch. The optics are horrible, and it doesn't. It never seems to hurt him. And so there is something interesting at foot where I think that if we know anything about politics, from you know Marie Antoinette to George to both George Bushes, it's that you know if times are hard, you have to at least pretend to care and to be in touch. And I mean, how many days did it take Obama to get to? You know, New Orleans after this hurricane recently. I mean, he doesn't do the little things that I think smart retail politicians do. Um, he can't, you know, he, he can't say, I, I feel your pain. And yet, um, it doesn't seem to hurt him. It really doesn't. I, I'm, I, I am very interested uh, in trying to discover why the voters are giving him an incredible pass on a lot of stuff. Well, I mean, liberals were very frustrated in the Reagan days. And they call Reagan the Teflon president. You know, Reagan exactly. says these dumb things, and we turn tail. People like them. On. What's that? Yeah, but people like them anyway. They well, like yeah. them. I mean, just Reagan like made a lot of folks feel good about America, good about the direction America was on, especially relative to how they felt about America at the end of Carter. And like, I think Carter gets a bad rap. I'm a big Carter fan, but I can, I can honestly say people were not happy with the direction things were going in 1980. And Reagan did a very good job of reminding people, man, we were really in the, in the ditch in 1980. 
Yeah. You know, whatever frustrations you might have had about the last four years, we're certainly a hell of a lot better off than we were back then. And and the disposition that I'm getting about America is not the same kind of dour, um, uh, you know, malaise, you know, kind of uh, image that Carter was presenting. So for you know, you know, Carter handled the Iran cost, the Iran hostage crisis, you know, and, and employing kind of a rose garden strategy where he, I'm not going to leave the White House. I'm going to stay on the job. I'm going to deal with this very difficult situation, you know, which all sounds very noble. It sounds like the proper statesmanly thing to do, uh, but it actually. Uh, made him look more ineffectual because he didn't have magic wands that could uh, that could have resolved that crisis. So sitting at the White House and not that's it. That's and, and an with, interesting point. It, maybe if if Carter had pretended as as Obama seems to be doing with with the Middle East and the economy that everything was okay and done you know ESPN and TV shows. Then, then the American public might have felt like, well, things are okay. The president's out there doing stuff. He doesn't seem to be hunkered down in the White House. He's not uh, too worried about this, so maybe we shouldn't be either. And maybe that's Obama's strategy. And it does. I, seem I, don't, to think, def- I don't think it's just a, a, a PR gambit. You know, with, you know, Saddam Hussein, with the first Bush, the elder Bush, before the, the first Gulf War, you know, he had American hostages. This is one of our first big hostage situations. Uh, you know, after the Iran hostage crisis, and Bush Sr. went off and played golf. <laughs> you know, I mean, and it, and it wasn't just a political thing. It was a way to to signal to Iraq, you know, you don't you don't have me. You don't you don't, you don't have my balls in a sling. <laughs> I'm going to go right. do my stuff. You you don't have anything on me. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Regardless remember of remember the Michael Moore football. the Michael Moore video or movie that showed yeah, Bush playing golf. golf. I mean, they pilloried him with that. Um, That's and, Bush and Jr. showed how out of touch. They, I mean, there, there's a political risk that you're going to be attacked as, as being out of touch. But again, you know, Bush Jr. won after that movie came out. So it wasn't a killer argument to put out there. Um, so I think what Obama is trying to do, and this, is, this is, goes back to the first campaign in the financial crisis where McCain suspended his campaign. Obama said, look, you got to walk and chew gum at the same time. You know, Obama has always stuck to an image of you know, calm hand at the tiller, regardless of what crazy stuff gets thrown his way. And even though pundits say you're you're aloof and you're too detached and you're too professorial and it's not what people want, he's stuck to that attitude. And I, it's, I think it's certainly working for him politically. And I would argue, and I know I know you have a lot to say about about what's going on in Libya uh, in the Middle East, so I, I want to segue to that, uh, but. I do think that what's going on there right now is being dampened. You know, it's not becoming a, a massive beyond a brush fire where you're where you're you're, you're now having a you know, complete chaos because Obama is not treating this in a, in a in a trigger happy way. Uh, I think he's finding a sweet spot where uh, you know tensions are beginning to slowly uh, recede. Uh, and I think part of that is to do with that that, that kind of I'm going to go about my business uh, kind of approach to this stuff. No, I mean there is that thing where in life, if um, if you act like that they've got you, then people sit, smell blood and, and pile on. And if you act like everything's fine, then people tend to think everything's fine. I mean, look, you could walk into the Daily Caller today wearing a pair of you know, overalls and be like, hey, they said, wh- where are we moving these big screen TVs to? Oh, they said to take them back. To th-. And you could like walk in front of all of our staff and interns and like unscrew one of our big screen TVs and probably walk out the door with it if you acted like you knew what you were doing. I mean, so much of life is is looking uh, nonplussed. Is that right? Anyway. Uh, is, now, is, you, is, you feel there there is something uh, simmering here with how Obama has handled uh, the, the Libyan uh, attack on the embassy. Well, yes, I think that um, it appears not just to me, but to a lot of people um, that President Obama intentionally downplayed and mischaracterized the killing of an American ambassador as a spontaneous demonstration brought about by a silly YouTube video. In fact, it seems very obvious now to everybody that it was, in fact, a terrorist attack that happened on the anniversary of 9 11. And it's a very big deal that the President of the United States would do such a thing, misleading the country, 
blaming free speech and refusing to use the word terrorist. And it reminds me when Don Rumsfeld was rightly mocked for not calling insurgents insurgents. It is terrorism. It's not our fault. It's not the fault of free speech. Um, it was a planned attack. America did not have security in place or you know, take seriously uh, the anniversary. And then to mislead and to send Susan Rice, the ambassador of the UN on television, on national television, to basically lie to the American people about it. It's nothing short of Nixonian. It's incredibly serious. And yet Obama, with his willing accomplices in the media, uh, doesn't pay any sort of price for this. And I think that the press and the public are much more concerned about replacement refs in the NFL than they are about the President of the United States lying about you know, the cause of what killed, I think, four Americans. Nobody's outraged. Well, that's very harsh. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't agree with all the premises there. Um, uh, I, I, I think that um, you know, there, there is uh, there, there's a couple of things here. One, they still are saying they're doing an investigation. Uh, so right. That's they're, they're, being care, they're being careful not to be uh, uh, to draw very specific conclusions yet, and you you could argue that is being political, or that that's being careful. Uh, well, are they going to have so, the results before or after the election? That, that's how you can know if it's political or not. I mean, well, we'll, we'll also see what what what's the official government report at the end of all this, and what 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 journalists have to say after that that report comes out. Uh, whether independent reporting is done. Uh, I, I think it is. I, I think it's sort of premature to to say we know exactly what happened yet. Uh, the president. There, I think if you look at what Obama said at the at the Univision uh, town hall. He was asked specifically, "Do you have information indicating that it was Iran or Al Qaeda organizing the protests?" And he said, "Quote: Well, we're still doing an investigation, and there going to be different circumstances, different countries, and so I don't want to speak to something until we have all the information." What we do know is that the natural protests that arose because of the outrage over the video were used as an excuse by extremists to see if they can directly harm U.S. interests. Now, you can complain that he didn't say terrorists in that and said extremists. That, to me, is not a big deal, uh, what, what the word choice is. And it may be that they want to be a little careful uh, with their word choices. Other, other officials have said terrorists in describing this. Um, but it may be that... You know, the, the, the foreign policy aspect of this, which, it, it, look, I think Obama's got a different foreign policy than George Bush. People, I think, uh, obscure that sometimes. I think they're very different. Uh, I think Obama is very careful not to communicate to the wider world in a war on terror framework because they don't think it's going to be conducive to actually quelling terrorism. Uh, and so if they can talk about this in a way that doesn't suggest we're going to use this as a causes belli to unleash hell on, on, on the Muslim world, they think that's going to be a good tragedy. What you have had, I think, since these, these protests have begun, is that they are subsiding, and that the people who are in power in Egypt and Libya, uh, who are democratically elected, and maybe not be our bestest, bestest of friends, but they are putting these protests down. There, you know, Morsi, who is, uh, who is Muslim Brotherhood, president of Egypt, you know, his first statement of uh, on this was not you know, rah rah America, and that made people a little uncomfortable. But at the end of the day, he his police put down the protests. He right. wasn't out there on the streets chanting down to America. My concern, uh, though, is 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 with the president of the United States misleading the American people. And there's a there's a, a piece in the Daily Beast yesterday that said U.S. intelligence officials knew within 24 hours that the assault on the consulate was a terrorist attack. And yet it took the Obama administration weeks before they would concede as much. And the, and the president still won't say, use the T word. What, the, what, what, does, what does no mean in that context? I mean, they got some intelligence that said that. But we all know someone's raw intelligence is imperfect. So maybe you, you get that and you still want to be a little bit careful how you characterize it. And you, and, and you don't necessarily want to say it's an either or situation. You know, the, the video might still have some uh, some a fact being a factor here, even if it was an organized attack too. There might be some conflation going on. No, um, I mean I have no doubt that some of the people who turned out 
were turned out because you know demagogues used the video to inspire them to turn out. And obviously, the video did have an impact in other, uh, you know, other other countries. Um, but but I do think it's important to tell the truth to the American public, um, and especially if it appears that you are misleading them for political purposes. Which, well, this was the implication in the Glenn Kessler. Right. Glenn Kessler is the professional fact checker uh, at the Washington Post, although this piece they wrote really wasn't a fact check kind of piece. He, he seemed to have a lot more subjective opinion in it and, and, and less factual conclusion. It was helpful to, to lay out the timeline of comments as he did. I, I credit him for that. But he prefaced it by saying, for political reasons, it certainly was in the White House's interest to not portray the attack as a terrorist incident especially what took place on the anniversary of the September 11th attacks. Instead, the administration kept the focus on what was ultimately a red herring, anger in the Arab world over an anti-Muslim video post on YouTube. That, to me, is not a factual statement. That's an opinion on Glenn, Glenn Kessler's part. Well, uh, I, wrote not a, obvious to, I wrote a piece it's yesterday. It's not obvious to me that it's, it, that it's not in the White House's interest to portray it as a terrorist attack. It might have been totally in their political interest to say, this is terrorism, we're going to crush this with our iron fists. That could have been completely been their political interest to do that. It may not have been their foreign policy interest to do that. And therefore, they were more, more circumspect and careful about their language. And it's not necessarily true that the video is ultimately a red herring. There's still evidence that the, the video has a lot to do with this here. Um, even if it's an organized attack, the, 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 the Al Qaeda folks might be trying to use that as as their spark and trying to channel it to their interests. But I don't think it's fair to say that this has nothing to do with anything whatsoever. Uh, so I, look, I mean, maybe Kester's right, but he doesn't have the facts at his disposal to, to know that he's right. They said that's an opinion, not a fact. Well, and I wrote a piece yesterday that I think was probably more charitable toward President Obama because I listed several possible um, reasons for this. Now, they were all bad reasons, but uh, I didn't assume that Obama was doing it for political purposes. I saw factored, factored in the possibility that it might be that he that he uh, doesn't view this as terrorism, that he thinks it's a, more of a crime, um, that he essentially doesn't believe that terror, you know, in, in treating terrorism as a global war on terrorism, but it's like a police action. I mean, there are several possible viewpoints, but I do think a few points here. One, there are four Americans dead, including an, an ambassador, and we should know why that happened. And it's not fair to their families. Uh, they need to know what, if they were martyrs, uh, you know, what happened. Um, I think it's the least we owe them. I also think, and I hate to play the what if it was Bush game, but what if, if this if this were Bush, if you know if if Bush were misleading the public apparently. Um, and people died. I suspect a lot of liberals that's, who... That's not, that's not a hypothetically real place. <laughs> well, okay, <laughs> we don't have to do it as a hypothetical, maybe, but I suspect a lot of the liberals who are defending Obama today would be outraged. Bush lied, people died, right? They would be outraged about that. And look, I also think there's the other point about the video, which is there are some people who are using this in this incident as an excuse to argue America should have less free speech. That's a serious consequence, especially if it's based on a false premise. So this is serious. I think we need to be honest about what happened, um, regardless of, you know, I mean, I think the American public deserves to know. I, 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 I mean, I obviously agree that we should have, that no one should be misleading here, but no one has made the case to me that Obama is misleading when he says, what we do know is that the natural protests that arose because of the outrage over the video were used as an excuse by extremists to see if they could directly harm U.S. interests. Um, you know, it, at minimum, uh, I don't say anyone can argue that is that is an intentionally misleading statement. One, it could very well be completely accurate. But but Susan um, Rice, but okay, that's a fair point. But Susan Rice went on national television days after this event happened. I don't have the transcript in front of me, but to my recollection, she said, no, this was not terrorism. This was a spontaneous demonstration that got out of hand. And because a lot of people in this part of the country happened to have, I don't know, rocket launchers, they quickly went back and got them. But the fact that it was on 9-11, that was pure coincidence. I mean, it, 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 it is hard. I have the, I, I'm looking at the Kessler okay. piece here. They have, they have the Rice quote. This is the Rice quote. This is from September 16th, so five days after. Five days uh, after. 
based on the best information we have to date, it began spontaneously in Benghazi as a reaction to what had transpired some hours earlier in Cairo, where, of course, as you know, there was a violent protest outside our embassy sparked by this hateful video. But soon after that spontaneous protest began outside our consulate in Benghazi, we believe that it looks like extremist elements, individuals joined in that effort with heavy weapons of the sort of, of the sort that are unfortunately readily now available in Libya post-revolution, and that it spun from there into something much, much more violent. We do not have information at present that leads us to conclude this was premeditated or pre-planned. -pre now, maybe that was wrong. <laughs> maybe it was pre-planned. Um, but I don't think it's fair to accuse Rice of saying something knowingly misleading. Uh, uh, she's saying we, ha we do have information at present. Uh, maybe, they got inf maybe the information that, that, trans that came about after the fact, maybe it's information that came about that wasn't in Rice's hand. You're, she's the U.S. I mean, she, she's either, she's either, she's either lying, counsel. she's either lying or incredibly naive. Either way, it's a disqualification for her job as far as I'm concerned. Well, I don't think it's, I think it's a disqualification to be careful. <laughs> Uh, and, and, to, and to not talk in certainty if you don't, if you don't know certainty. Um, so I, I, I'm more than happy to see further an investigation of this and to make sure at the end of the day we, we, we know everything that's going on. But I think we've seen a lot of instances in the past several years where what looks to be true early on ends up not being true. Once more information uh, it, it, it is dug up. Uh, okay, so I don't want to argue about um, if you're right or I'm right. I'm, I think... We're both brilliant, and we've both presented very, <laughs> very compelling cases. But what I do think is interesting is the fact that no, that this story, eh, I mean, even though the Washington Post fact checker writes a piece, rightly or wrongly alleging that President Obama misled Americans, you know, the seriousness of the allegation that he's making, eh, nobody's really that concerned. Not as long as the replacement refs are gone by the time... Thursday night's kickoff takes place because God knows, you know, bread and circuses, you know, football and pizza has replaced bread and circuses. Uh, and and uh, as long as that's fine. And, oh, if Romney says something stupid, God knows we're going to talk about that because that's so much more important than what's happening in the Middle East. You see why it's frustrating a bit here, Bill. Well, I, I think the Romney campaign is... Are, are not timid wallflowers here. <laughs> they've, they've leveled plenty of very harsh charges of dishonesty against the, the Obama White House and the Obama campaign. Uh, you know, if you want to put the blame on, if, if you believe that there is sort of a very you know good case to make that Obama was misleading the public about Libya, Romney can make it. <laughs> Romney can make it right now. Maybe he's saving for the debate. Um, but I uh, my guess is that even when you read the whole Glenn Kessler fact check here, that it it's not that clear cut a case, and if, and you know, Romney already got dinged on Libya, uh, making an accusation that seemed you know ahead of the facts. Well, Romney was to uh, the problem is as Joe Scarborough correctly said today. Given the choice between talking about a political story or a policy story, the press will always talk about the political story. Romney made a huge tactical error because he gave the press an excuse to talk about politics. He injected himself and sort of horse race process politics right in the middle of this story, uh, which I think the press is now getting around to asking you know, serious questions. But Romney, I think, um, stepped on that story. Uh, Romney stepped on a whole lot of stories. <laughs> <laughs> we know. stepped on other but, things, too, but, but stories. But, you know, this Glenn Kessler piece is from this morning. If Ryan wants to take that piece and wave at a rally and say, here's the timeline. This proves that President Obama misled the public and, it, and is shirking from the reality of terrorism that his decisions in, in Egypt and Libya have brought upon us. Uh, if he wants to level a charge like that, I guarantee you it would get covered by the media. It would be a dominant story. It is an extremely harsh charge to make, and the media loves harsh charges. It wouldn't work, though. It, it, it wouldn't he work. Has the goods to make that charge. It wouldn't work. It would hurt Romney. You and I both know it, and it has nothing to do with the merits of the charge. It just wouldn't work, and I think partly because, as, as I've stated earlier, the public is giving Obama a pass. He is sort of this Teflon president. Maybe, I mean, I don't well, want to compare. I mean, if, I mean if, that's your, if that's your answer, you're saying the Romney can't, Romney's a sure loser because anything he charges at Obama can never stick. 
I guess it would be a very close election, but in terms of media coverage, in terms of um, getting uh, – Romney has not been able to drive a narrative this entire election. I mean, maybe there were a couple occasions you, you didn't build that caught on a bit. But by and large, Romney has not been able to drive the media narrative at all. Um, well, I, I think that it is very hard – uh, it's very hard to make a national security charge in Obama because he bagged Bin Laden and Gaddafi. He's got, so he's got some notches on his belt that make it hard to have a narrative that says he, he hates America, he apologizes for America, he's weak in the face of terrorism. You know, you have some very obvious data points that, that undercut that. Um, so that makes a charge of this, I think, difficult. But, look, lying is lying, and so if you've got, you got someone to lie, I think you you, you got something to work with there. I don't think it's a lie, but if Romney thinks it is, he could, he could give it a shot. Uh, well, look, I think it's simultaneously that. possible that Obama is very good at killing terrorists, that he uses these drone strikes, um, and that also, you know, he was wrong about the Arab Spring, or that there's consequences to his decision there. And, and so, I mean, it, it's confusing. And, see, that doesn't work in politics. You know, nuance doesn't work. Um, you have to explain, well, he's good at this, but he's not good at that. And that, that's inherently the problem. I think you're right. He put big points on the board, and, and that, uh, that covers a multitude of sins. Uh, and on the, the economic stuff, which is always supposed to be where Romney was going to be strong here, uh, and that you didn't build that, was going to expose that you know, Obama's juvenile view of the role of the government is what's dragging the economy down. Uh, you know, you're now seeing increased optimism in the economy. It's not total optimism. It's not a majority of the country being optimistic, but it's on it's on an upward track. Uh, and and you still don't see people blaming Obama for the economy. People, people still blame Bush more than Obama. Uh, so you know, the Romney bet was that people were so disappointed in Obama uh, that you could drive that and then and and make a frame that he doesn't know what he's doing. And I do know know what I'm doing. But if people actually feel once the two plans, the two personalities are, are, are put next to each other, that, hey, as, as, as uh, tough as it's been, we're in a better place now than four years ago, uh, and we're on the right path and not on the wrong path, then whatever pithy charge Romney does put up there, I do think has a hard time making, making it stick. You didn't build that didn't have the traction that they hoped it would have. Uh, and so I, I, I think it's more just sort of Obama being uh, – you know, a, a charismatic guy that makes some Tefla. I do think there's some substantive reasons why it's hard to make things stick based on people's perception of where America is right now and what Obama's done to, to that end. Uh, as it was with Reagan. I mean, Reagan, you know, did certain things. At least there was, there was an economic record there. Yeah. Uh, look, I, I, and I, I'm not saying I like the Reagan record. I think it was bad for economic inequality. I, I, well, I think the And good teams get, good teams get lucky, too. I mean... What's that? Good teams get lucky, too. I mean... The economy, Bill Clinton, the, the you know the economy uh, started to turn at the end of Bush's term, but not soon enough. And so, I mean, the, the good football teams that go to the Super Bowl get lucky too. I mean, they're good teams, but somehow, well, good good teams ball, take advantage of luck. <laughs> the ball bounces their way a little bit, um, and so that you know, it seems like you know it could be that. You've got a couple, you know, I'll play, I'll play Republican devil's advocate here. I mean, you've got Republican governors in states like Ohio and Wisconsin that have done a good job. The economies are turning around there. Um, and then you have maybe just luck, like, um, you know, things are just slightly ticking upward here at just the right time for Obama and right the wrong time for Romney. Um, probably has nothing. Reich has made the counter argument here. You got, you got two job reports left. You got you got a job report at the top of October and top of November, and True. we don't know what they're going to look like. Uh, you know, if if they really tank, you know, does Romney have a fresh opportunity to say, "You see, I told you so." Yeah. Uh, I, I don't get the sense that people think that we're headed for you know a disaster number. We might get the sort of the same kind of middling numbers that we've had uh, that haven't proven to be enough to, to drag Obama down and make the case that we're going in the wrong direction. Well, and it clearly the Romney, I mean, clearly the fundamental problem, well, I hate to say the fundamental problem, but one of the fundamental problems that Romney, the Romney people made was an, a, a, a wrong assumption that if the economy was bad, if unemployment was over 8%, Obama could not win. And that um, sounded like a very, I, I would have probably said that's true. I mean, it sounded like a very plausible scenario. Turns out, I don't think it's right. 
And I think they banked we, so we much. We debated this, you know, you know, over a year ago, the, we, we, we said we, you don't know what exactly the number has to be for people to feel good about it or how fast the trajectory has to be. And the and trajectory right now, is more important than the number. <laughs> right. And the trajectory, it, you know, the unemployment peaked at around 10 percent and now it's 8 percent. So it's not dramatically better than it was, but it's somewhat better than it was. Uh and that's better, and, and, and even if it's not exactly where it was before Obama came in, it's still better than, than, it, than it was at its peak. That seems to be enough. <laughs> that seems to be enough to keep Obama around. Uh, and maybe that maybe that changes based on in the numbers of the next next two months. But actually, at this moment, that number seems to be good enough. Right. Uh, interesting. We do live in interesting times, Bill. <laughs> we do live in uh, ble- Blessed be that the case. Yes. Um, but I'm sure many more interesting things to, e- e- even if uh, the poll numbers widen because the debates are up ahead, because the job numbers reports are in front of us, uh, you can never be totally sure. We'll have much to talk about uh, over the next six weeks. It ain't over till it's over. <laughs> Always good to talk to you, Matt Lewis. Likewise, Bill Share. Good times. Uh, And we'll talk to you next week. In the DMZ.